Hi guys. Okay, uh, we have finished midterm two, and I um, think that went pretty well for us. So we are now uh, moving on to uh, chapter 19 this week. Um, and um, we're going to be talking about accounting for income taxes. Um, I'm going to say a few words about pensions, not a lot, and I'll kind of talk more about why I'm uh, de-emphasizing that a little bit for our text. And then um, next week, chapter 21, we'll talk a little bit about chapter 24. Again, um, the material that's here can it's probably covered in another class as well. So I'm not going to spend as much time uh, with that. So um, we really have two more chapters left where we're actually going to be prepping for the midterm. So I'll be putting up a practice midterm for chapter 19 and next week a practice midterm for chapter 21. Uh, the week of the 18th, I will leave open and we're going to do the same sort of thing that we've done in the past. Open the exam on that Sunday and leave you the entire week to schedule your exam. Um, you'll have to uh, take your exam uh, no later than the 24th of um, April, which will give you a full week. I'll close at 11.59 on Saturday, very similar to how we've been doing. Open it at 12 a.m. on the 18th. You'll have that full seven-day period to work the exam. I'll give three hours. It will be uh, 20 multiple choice questions with the uh, full-blown problem at the end, the way we've been doing. So just like our two midterms, uh, it is important to realize that the um, paper is also due around that time uh, on April 25th. So let's just make sure we're clear that uh, you need to turn that assignment in. A couple of you already have. Okay, so when you go to um, e-learning, let's just go back to our uh, home page here, and you go into the course for e-learning, the guest speaker assignment's right there. So make sure you follow those directions carefully. Put that in because I have to go to grades by the 30th of April, so I can't give you any more time on that because i got to read through the papers and give you the appropriate grade, and that is an important part of your grade. So make sure that you are um, paying attention to the syllabus and getting through the various things that you need to here, okay? Okay, if there's no... I think we are good to go here and start to take a look at um, chapter 19, but do be paying attention here as we wrap up the course that you're getting everything in on time. And I'll give more information about the final, but it's just gonna be those two chapters, okay? But let's go ahead and let's start with um, the slides here now for chapter 19, talking about uh, deferred taxes, okay? And um, or accounting for income taxes, I guess is better way to say that. So what we're going to see is that there will often be a difference between what we report for our income following the general accepted accounting principles promulgated by the Financial Accounting Standards Board versus what we report to the IRS on our tax return um, for our tax expense and our tax reporting purposes. And because of those differences, we're going to see that will report our tax expense using the gap rules on our financial statements, but that's gonna be different than what we owe to the IRS, our taxes payable at any point in time to the IRS. And they call those differences um, actually temporary differences in many cases. Some are permanent, but for the most part, they are temporary differences, and we're going to see uh, how those temporary differences will translate into our um, deferred tax liability or even potentially a deferred tax asset, okay? So let's just go ahead as I plug in my little uh, clicker and we can see um, that we're going to understand some of the fundamentals here um, and then we're going to um, look at something called loss carry forwards and then we're going to look at the presentation and primarily affects the uh, balance sheet and the income statement as to how we'll present transactions for our accounting for taxes, okay? So let's just go look at some basic things here at the very beginning, okay? And notice that we will report our income tax expense and we'll report that 
based on our gap rules that'll hit our income statement. What is payable will often be different, okay? And that's really the whole point of this class, which are these, um, these temporary differences for the most part. There could also be some permanent differences and we'll talk about those too. But these temporary differences in which something is reported in income for gap purposes this period, but we're not going to report it for income purposes until a future period for tax purposes. Or maybe there's an expense that we'll take now for tax purposes, but we won't take it until later for gap purposes and so forth. Okay, so we're going to start to talk about those and how those will generate a deferred uh, tax liability, a deferred tax asset, and there will be a difference between our gap tax expense and our uh, income tax payable. Okay, so you can see here that uh, we follow the rules that are promulgated by the IRS, um, the tax reform they say up there, uh, or what's on the tax return, right, what's on the tax return, not tax reform, but what's on the tax return uh, that gets reported to the IRS, um, that generates our taxable income according to the tax code. And then that's what we have to send in a check to the IRS for. When I say we, I mean the company. We're talking about corporate taxes here, okay? Uh, versus what we report to our investors or bondholders or stockholders, whatever. We use GAAP and that will generate a different income tax expense. And that difference is going to generate a deferred tax. Could be liability in some cases. In other cases, uh, it could be a deferred tax asset. Okay, so let's just look at this example, and we've got this Chelsea Inc. reported revenue of one hundred thirty thousand and expenses of sixty thousand in each of the first three years of operation. Yeah, okay, we know that you know even under GAAP purposes, we're not going to have the same exact income for three years, but we just want to make this example uh, easy. Okay, for tax purposes, Chelsea reported the same expenses to the IRS but reported taxable revenue of 100,000 in 2020, 150,000 in 2021, and 140,000 in 2022. Now, when you look at that, you're like, okay, well, look, we have a very similar amount of income over this period. What, 100 plus 150 is uh, 250 plus 140, is 290 and 130 times 3 is 290. So why would there be a difference that would generate deferred tax liability, deferred tax asset? Well, it's the timing. It's that we're going to have to year by year report that there is a difference between our gap tax expense and what is payable to the IRS because we reported different incomes in the under tax laws versus gap rules in those uh, in those three years. But ultimately, uh, in this case, this entire, uh, what's gonna end up being a deferred tax liability will reverse at the end of the uh, three year period, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at um, the uh, numbers here. And we can see that for gap reporting, right, what we're gonna report on our gap financial statements, we have what income tax expense of 14,000 each year. But what we owe to the IRS, because we're reporting what different amounts, right? We report less in the first year and more in the next two years. We actually have what? A different taxable income each year, not this 70,000 consistently. You multiply that by the tax rate, which is determined by the IRS. That doesn't change. Uh, we just pick up whatever the appropriate rate is applicable to our income levels at the um, IRS for corporations. That's at least currently around 40%, um, excuse me, around 20%. Okay. So what happens if you use that, then our tax payable uh, or tax expense, the way they're calling it here um, in the tax reporting world is 8,000, 18,000, 16,000, not the 14,000 per year like we see up in the uh, gap example, okay? So we start to take a look at that. My clicker is gonna play hide and seek with me tonight, okay? And we start to see that what? Well, the difference is 6,000 in 2020 between the two, and then what? 4,000, 2,000 in the next two years. So it does zero out at the end of these three years, um, but uh, notice that as our taxable income comes up, 
and our gap income comes down, that um, liability starts to reverse itself now as we go ahead and we start to pay more out to the IRS in those later years than what our gap income would indicate, okay? So you take a look and we have a deferred tax liability that first year and then as we start to send larger checks to the IRS for our taxes payable then would be indicated by our gap tax expense we start to liquidate that liability okay so that's the whole concept here they call these uh, temporary differences why do they call them temporary differences because they turn around after a period of time now we're going to see that some differences are considered permanent differences and when we have a permanent difference we are um, going to see that there will be no generation deferred tax asset or liability now in this example we had deferred tax liability because what we had already declared that as income for our gap purposes we've shown it as income for our gap purposes yet but not for tax purposes so the time is coming when we're going to have to send a bigger check to the irs that meets the definition of a liability. And so uh, we had the deferred tax liability came up that first year. And then as we paid larger amounts to the IRS, it comes down. Okay. All right. Good. Now for our financial reporting purposes, you can see that we will report our liabilities and we'll report them versus what is payable. Okay. That was based on our tax income. So that's what's payable to the IRS. And then the deferred tax liability was that portion that would reverse out um, as we move forward in those later years, the four and then the two. Okay, there's our taxes payable to the IRS. And the income tax expense that we report on the income statement is based on our gap income. Okay. Now we talked about the liability. Okay, let's just read through and see what they tell us about the liability here. Let's just try to get these sort of um, pictures in our mind based off the example. Now let's put some um, words to it. So tax liability represents the increase in tax payable in future years as a result of temporary differences existing at the end of the year. <clears throat> a deferred tax asset, which we'll look at here in a minute, represent taxes uh, refundable or saved in future years as a result of deductible temporary differences existing at the end of the current year. So in other words, there'll be some amounts that we've already taken as expense for <clears throat> gap purposes that we won't be able to take until later years for tax purposes. So we have what a future economic benefit. And so we'll recognize a deferred tax asset for that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at that here in a couple minutes, okay? All right, so that should get us a good, nice um, introduction now to this area here of our uh, deferred taxes, just some basic concepts. Okay, uh, before we um, move on to the next example, uh, let's take a look at the journal entries for that uh, previous example with this Chelsea and um, you can see that um, in the 2020, we go ahead, we debit the income tax expense. That's based on our gap income, right? We go ahead and we credit income tax payable. That's what we're going to be sending a check to the IRS whenever it's due. Even when we're uh, doing this, maybe we figure we're going to have to send this in in uh, March 15th or April 15th or whatever the corporate filing deadline is. I'm not a tax guy, guys, but I know that eventually you have to send a check into them, to the IRS for whatever is payable. And then uh, we have the deferred tax liability, which we know is going to reverse and it will reverse as we move into um, the future periods. And my clicker's going to, first it was hiding from me. Now it doesn't want to work. And now my uh, slides want to lock up on me. Okay, so here we go. Taking a look at the uh, next slide, we can see that uh, that will reverse, start reversing in 2021, when now we have a larger tax bill than what our tax expense indicates. So that extra money is actually that we're sending into the IRS. We're seeing this extra IRS is saying, hey, you know, you owe it to us based on your taxable income. Um, and so then um, that will reduce that 4,000 in 2021 
and then by uh, 2022, that entire amount is going to be uh, liquidated, okay? Now they show us a little bit, you know, some of the obvious here, I think you could realize that or see that in your mind's eye at the T account, that it's zeroed out by the end of the three year period here. And then for our um, financial statement impact, of course, we would have our taxes payable based on what we owe to the IRS. We'd have the deferred tax liability that we know is going to reduce 4000 the first year, 2000 uh, well, it'll increase 6000 the first year, then it decreases 4000 in 2021, and then the remaining 2000 in 2022. From the standpoint of our income statement, uh, we are showing income tax expense, the 14000 each year there uh, based on our gap income. Okay, all right, good. So uh, you can see then um, when we show our income statement, we will show our tax expense into the current and uh, deferred portion. This is 2020 here uh, on the bottom part here showing you what our uh, tax would look like on the income statement. And boy, I'm having trouble keeping track of my little devices here today. Okay, just looking at this little part here, you can see that we would have our uh, current and deferred portions of our income tax expense called out. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at the uh, next example here, which will help us understand a little bit more about how these deferred tax liabilities uh, can arise and how they'll uh, reverse themselves. So let's go ahead and take a look at this example. And we have this South Carolina corporation. And again, we have these temporary differences, temporary differences, meaning of course, they're gonna turn around in future periods. And that's at the end of 2020. And the temporary difference will reverse and cause taxable amounts of 55,000 2021, 60,000 2022, and 75,000 2023. Um, I'm not sure how we changed company from South Carolina to Starfleet in this example, um, but the name changed here in the middle of the example. I'm not sure what, uh, what happened with the slide that the text provided us, but anyway, same company. Pre-tax financial income for 2020 is 300,000 and the tax rate is 30% for uh, all years and there were no deferred taxes at the beginning of 2020. So uh, very similar to our last example, um, they want us to compute taxable income and income taxes payable for 2020, and then uh, prepare the journal entry to record income tax expense, the deferred income taxes, and the income taxes payable. Uh, so when they ask us the tax expense, uh, that's they're calling that a plug, and uh, I don't agree with that um, presentation either, because 300,000 times the uh, tax rate of 0.3 will give us the 90,000, okay? That's how you get the current year's tax. It's based on your gap income. That's what you report on your income statement is your uh, income tax expense. So I disagree that that's a plug. Um, and then you continue on and the income tax payable, okay, they finally got uh, something right here, is the, and they took the, the timing differences, temporary differences, off of this year's uh, financial income to get the taxable income because again those amounts uh that hundred and ninety thousand the total of the three uh, amounts 55 60 and 75 that will um be uh, reported to the irs in future periods and um, so that's going to be subtracted off and then we get to what's left which is what's reported to the irs this year that results in the 33,000, which is the taxes payable. We said tax payable, presumably on tax day, they're gonna send in that check to the IRS for that amount. And then the remaining amounts that will then reverse in future periods, create the deferred tax liability. There was no change in the tax rate 
that was anticipated. And we're going to see, we're going to have to look at something called enacted rates later uh, in, in our discussion here today when the rates change or, or there's an enacted uh, change. Uh, we'll explain that here in a little while. Then you'd use a different rate. But in this case, uh, the rate is the same throughout. And so we just go ahead and multiply each one of those by the 30%. Or you could have taken the total 110 by, uh, and multiplied that and got the, um, not the 110, but the 190 and got that 57,000 deferred tax liability. Okay. All right, good. So very similar to the last example. I think we just had a few more years there uh, in the future that we were going to have to look at. Okay, good. Set. Okay, and so that's what we're going to look at now. Instead of later on having to report amounts in the income uh, for, uh, for tax purposes, creating a liability, now I've got a deduction coming in the future, future economic benefit. That meets the definition of an asset because I've got amounts that I can, uh, that I will be able to deduct against my taxable income in future periods, creating the deferred tax asset. And we're going to take a look at a couple of examples of those now coming up. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, next example now um, with the deferred tax asset. And in this example, now this hunt company, they have their revenues, they have operating expenses, and uh, they have a loss related to a $50,000 um, contingent liability um, that uh, they have gone ahead and accrued the loss for, right? Meeting our rules back for when you would take a uh, loss for a lawsuit, I guess is a probable loss here. And so for gap purposes, they've gone ahead and they've taken that loss. But for tax purposes, they won't be able to write off the impact of that um, lawsuit that they lost until they actually have to pay out uh, the damages. Uh, so we start to take a look at what happens over the next, um, you know, couple of years in this example. And we can see that for uh, 2020, for gap purposes, okay, just looking at the top part here, okay, for 2020, for gap purposes, we're looking and seeing that they have uh, income tax expense of 90,000, um, excuse me, yeah, tax expense of 90,000 or 450,000 of income because they've got that 50,000 loss. Of course, they won't take that in the future, right? You only take it when you actually have, uh, you know, accrued the loss, of course. And then uh, they'll have tax expense of 100,000 in the uh, future year in, in 2021, right? For tax purposes, we can't take that until we actually have to pay out. So we're going to have a lower taxable amount in the uh, future year than we have now, right? So uh, we have a deferred tax asset because we have a deduction coming in the future, okay? So uh, the amount of that deferred tax asset, of course, is going to be based on the future uh, deductible amount here now in this case of uh, 50,000 when we finally pay that lawsuit out and we have the uh, tax rate there of uh, 20%. Now it gives us the 10,000. Now you can look at how they've uh, calculated that there but let's just look at the journal entry I think is uh, easier to understand which is to look at our income tax expense for the period is based on the $450,000 of gap income times a tax rate of 20%, that's the 90,000. Income tax is payable is based on what we're reporting to the IRS as our income, we haven't taken that deduction yet. That $10,000 difference generates now a deferred tax uh, asset because we've got a future deductible amount coming up and you saw how we calculated that. Now, what happens um, is if you look at the, um, and I'm just going to go, and they show us a little bit uh, how to use the deferred tax asset account here to calculate our uh, income tax expense. But you take a look here, and um, <clears throat> you can see that in 2021, when we finally go ahead and uh, pay the, um, settlement, now we can take that as a 
deduction for tax purposes, so our income tax payable, as we saw in that earlier slide, will be based on the 450,000 and uh, we'll have uh, a tax expense for gap purposes of 100,000. Um, that 100,000 is based on the 500,000 of income because now we don't have that 50,000 deduction in 2021. And so that will then liquidate our deferred tax asset and uh, we'll credit that at that time. Okay, now just looking at how that's going to impact the uh, financial statement, and you can see that in 2020 on our um, income statement, we'll show the current portion that was based again, remember, on the 500,000 of income. Uh, they probably should have put a paren around there. The deferred portion is that deferred tax uh, asset that um, we're going to have a benefit in the future. So it's actually reducing our tax for uh, this year, the deferred amount. And so our net uh, income tax expense is the 90,000 based on the 450,000 of income, right? 20% tax rate. And we report our uh, net income that way, okay? And uh, again, I don't know that you necessarily uh, need to um, see a T account on that. Obviously it went up and then it went back down. We saw something similar like that uh, for our liability. Okay, so let's look at this um, next uh, example, a little more detailed example. Uh, similarly to how we looked at the uh, liability and uh, deferred tax liability and covered over a couple of different years here. Now we're going to look at the deferred tax asset in that same light. And so we have this Columbia Corporation and they have a temporary difference at the end of 2020 that will reverse and cause deductible amounts of 50, 65, and 40 in the upcoming uh, years 2021, 20, 22, and 23. Columbia's pre-tax financial income for uh, 2020 is 200000 Tax rate is 34% for all the years. There are no deferred taxes at the beginning of 2020 and Columbia expects um, to be profitable in future years. So we go ahead and we compute taxable income. They want us to compute taxable income and taxes payable uh, for 2020 and then to prepare the uh, journal entry for that. So you take a look at the uh, table here that they've created comparing our gap income of 200,000. We have this uh, amount that we're not able to um, deduct yet for um, gap purposes or um, what we are taking for gap purposes now. We won't be able to take them until future period, future periods for tax purposes. And so um, we add that back to our gap income, those temporary differences, 155. So we've got taxable income of 355. So you take the taxable income, and I don't know why they keep jumping around on this on the tax rates here, but now we've got 34%, 355 times 34% uh, gives us our income tax um, payable to the IRS, right? Because we haven't taken those deductions yet of 12700 and you can see, you know, that's the credit for the taxes payable, right? Now, our um, income tax expense is going to be, and it's obviously the 200000 right? Because we've already taken those deductions, um, taken that off of our taxable income um, for our um, gap purposes times the 34%. We've already taken that off of our income for gap purposes, so that's where the 68,000 comes from. And then when those amounts become deductible in the future, uh, we'll be able to um, you know, have a tax deduction. We'll have a lower uh, taxable income in the future. That generates a deferred uh, tax asset. So the sum of those uh, differences and times the tax rate gives us the deferred tax asset here of the 52.7. Okay, all right, good. Now, deferred tax asset, um, we're going to continue to look at what happens when, in the case of potential uh, valuation allowance. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and continue on now uh, looking at the notion of evaluation allowance for our deferred uh, tax um, asset. Okay, so you can see here that um, we have to set up a valuation allowance if we determine that we're not going to be able to realize the entire deferred tax asset. So when you look at the uh, next slide where we're going to consider this valuation allowance, notice here, and we'll just look at this example. Uh, and this example, even though it's um, trying to talk about the valuation allowance, kind of, they've kind of buried the lead and they give you more information than just how to deal with the valuation allowance because they tell us that uh, Jennifer Capital Corp has a deferred tax asset account with a balance of 75000 at the end of 2019 due to a singular, single cumulative temporary difference of 375000 uh, at the end, this same temporary difference has increased an amount of 500000 So it's increased 125000 Taxable income for 2020 is 820 The tax rate is 20%. And they had no valuation allowance previously. So just looking at the numbers here, um, you can see that we had, what, 375000 was the temporary difference. And um, then you can see that um, it came up to 500,000 um, by 2021. So um, it has increased now. They're saying it'll be in 2021, it'll be 500,000. We're in the current year 2020. So if you take 500,000 minus the 375, it has come up, what, 125,000, right? 125,000 times 0.2, uh, which is the tax rate here, okay, 125,000 times 0.2 gives me 25,000. So what they're basically saying here at the start is, look, I need 25,000 more for my deferred tax asset because my temporary difference um, has gone from 375 at the start of 2019, and now I estimate by 2021 that will be uh, 500,000. Okay, so now you start to look at some of these numbers, and they want to therefore increase the uh, deferred tax asset from 75 to, um, and it's going to go up to 100,000. They want to increase it an additional 25,000. Okay. Now, of course, our income tax expense is based on our gap income. So our gap income here is uh, six ninety five. Okay, just showing you how they come up with the elements of this journal entry six ninety five, six ninety five. Okay, so we've got this six hundred ninety five thousand times the tax rate point two is giving me this 139,000, okay? Is giving me 139,000. That's where the income tax expense is coming from. It's always based on my gap income. And then you can see right here, they've showed us our tax payable is what we're reporting to the IRS as our um, taxable income. Uh, and we multiply that by 20 percent that gives us the 164 okay now we've seen this already and you're like well john we looked at this what about this valuation allowance and all they're saying here is hey they've determined that they are not going to be able to necessarily benefit from that entire um, hundred thousand of um, deferred tax asset that they have now and so they put an amount in the valuation allowance and they made an estimate that um, they should put a, an amount of 15000 into the valuation allowance. Well, if that's the case, then what? Then my income tax expense is going to um, come up for the 15000 for the amount that I'm not going to have a uh, future tax benefit. And I set up the allowance, and the valuation allowance essentially does what? It is reported as a reduction on my deferred tax asset. That was the 75 plus the 100 plus the 25 brought it to 100 
but then we report the valuation allowance of 15. Okay, so the key thing is actually right here where they've gone ahead and taken the valuation allowance for that 15,000 that they do not uh, think that they will be able to benefit and that uh, 15,000 will then be reported against the uh, deferred tax asset. Okay, all right, so it's important to always look to see the likelihood that they will actually uh, collect on that deferred tax asset and uh, that would then warrant setting up a, uh, a valuation allowance, okay? Okay, let's go ahead and continue on now to our um, second objective and we're going to start to get into some different issues. Main thing in this section is going to be now we're going to talk about permanent differences, okay? But just before we get to that couple things, uh, income state pr presentation, you do show your tax expense broken into the current versus deferred portions and they're looking back to that Chelsea example where we had a portion was the current uh, based on uh, what we were going to have to send a check to IRS for. Then deferred is, and if it's a uh, deferred tax liability, of course, it's going to uh, increase our income tax expense and you see um, how the numbers would be presented there. Okay, now when we take a look, we've talked about temporary differences. Temporary differences can arise from a variety of differences between U.S. GAAP and uh, tax rules, okay? Again, and I know it gets a little bit scary when you start seeing all these different things that could generate uh, timing differences, uh, temporary differences, uh, I am not going to expect you to know anything about tax law. I'm not going to be testing your knowledge of even things we've talked about in this class is how they're handled for GAP purposes. I will make it very clear, like we've seen in some of the examples, there is a temporary difference of X amount and you just need to figure out how that affects a deferred tax liability, how it affects a deferred tax asset, and then um, how uh, that will um, parse out into our um, current and deferred portions of our income tax expense, okay? So I'm not spending any time talking about what generates, what originates these uh, temporary differences because I'm going to be telling you specifically there's this difference and it has created uh, a temporary difference and then you're going to need to be able to figure out how that affects the various elements I've talked about, deferred tax liability, asset, and then um, how it affects the current and deferred portion of our income tax expense. Okay? All right, good. Now, just some terminology here. We have the originating temporary difference. That's in the year that there's a difference between the gap income and the tax income, that's called the originating temporary difference. And then the reversing difference is when ultimately um, we then have to take amounts for tax purposes that we didn't take for gap purposes or vice versa. Okay, that's when it reverses. All right. Okay, good. So let's now get into this idea of permanent differences here. Okay, so let's see how some of that is going to play out. Okay, so let's go ahead and start to take a look at what happens now uh, when we have some um, permanent differences. Now, with a permanent difference, I just want to go ahead and put this back in a slideshow mode so you can see it a little better. With a permanent difference now, what happens is there's a difference between tax income and gap income and that difference will never reverse, okay? It'll always be a difference between the two. When you have a permanent difference, very important, permanent differences never result in a deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability because you're going to be taking an amount for gap purposes that you will never be able to take for um, tax purposes. And so there is no future economic benefit. There is no reversing later that might generate uh, liability. So no asset, no liability, okay, for a permanent difference. Now, again, 
um, we go through and we start to give you uh, and they start to give you in these slides listing of examples of permanent differences but um, I'm not going to again uh, require you to memorize the things that could be permanent differences I will call them out as permanent differences but just to understand an example here you can see this first one interest that you receive on state and local bonds they're called municipal state and municipal bonds um, those in those interests are never taxable at the federal level constitution says that the federal government cannot interfere in the revenue generating activity of state and local government that's in the constitution and so those amounts are not taxable um, you know um, at the federal level and they never will be okay that's a permanent difference uh, number five down here at the bottom fines and penalties even though you may have to pay them for some reason as a business and it's a legitimate expense it has to be reported on the financial statements it is never deductible for tax purposes okay now again I don't want to sit here and go through the list of every single thing that could generate a permanent difference if it is a permanent difference I will call that out as such on the question that I'm looking at so I'm not much interested in all the elaboration here that they do on what could cause some of these permanent differences I'm more interested that once you understand that something is a permanent difference that you know how to handle it okay so let's look at this example right here with the Zurich company and they have pre-tax financial income of 80,000 for 2020 the following items called uh, cause taxable income to be different depreciation on tax return is greater than the depreciation on the uh, income statement that could happen if you're using some sort of approved IRS method to accelerate depreciation you're taking that depreciation tax return so you've got a deduction now that lessens your tax bill but your depreciation gap purposes is less than that later on what will happen you won't be able to take as much depreciation on that asset in the future while you're still taking that um, uh, maybe a straight line depreciation on your gap financial statement so that'll generate a deferred tax liability okay rent collected on tax return is greater than rent earned on the income statement right we have some sort of rent we collected in advance since we collected the cash IRS says hey you got to declare that income and we're not going to take it into income until we earn it so we're paying the tax in a sense in advance on that that's going to create a deferred tax asset right when we finally um, are taking that income into our gap income but we already reported it in previous periods for IRS purposes okay now fines for pollution appears an expense of 11,000 on the income statement now even though this example did not call it out as such this is a permanent difference okay so when we calculate the deferred tax asset liability for these things up here we're going to see here when we go over the next slide that there is no deferred tax asset liability that is generated for this for this permanent difference okay all right so let's just go ahead and let's look at the numbers here now uh, how they play out and let's just start I think it's the best way to understand this is just sort of by looking at the journal entry since we understand the journal entry now and uh, let's go to some of the things we are clear on now you have your what gap income and then you have the excess depreciation that we took for tax purposes you have the basically rent you collected in advance which is deferred revenue for gap purposes but we're taking it as taxable income for our tax purposes and then they're adding back that 11,000 permanent difference uh, for the fine we'll never be able to deduct that for tax purposes so now our taxable income the report on our tax return is 102 we multiply that by the 30 percent that's what we set up for our taxes payable to the IRS right now what happens you have the deferred tax asset because I've already paid the tax on 27,000 yet I haven't taken it yet 
as income for GAAP purposes. So 27,000 times 30% gives me an 8,100 deferred tax asset because later I'll be able, I'll be um, taking that into my income, but I've already paid the tax on it for tax purposes, right? Then we have the excess depreciation. So I've already taken a deduction for tax purposes that I won't be able to take until the future for book purposes. So we multiply that by 30% and that generates the deferred tax liability. Okay. Now they record the asset and liability separately here because we would want our accounting system to be able to sit there and track whether we have assets liability so we can track their change over time. When we finally report them on the financial statement, GAP tells us, and we'll look at a slide later that'll point this out in writing. But I'm just telling you now because I know you're like, well, why wouldn't you net these? What they tell us is that we should net the deferred tax asset and liability ultimately for reporting on the financial statements. But in our GL, we would basically, I have two separate accounts like this, and then when we get around to reporting, we would net them, okay? So now the only part is, well, where does this tax expense come from? And again, I generally don't like to call things out as a plug if I don't have to, okay? So some things are a plug, but not this one, okay? So 80,000 plus the 11,000 permanent difference that'll never turn around, okay? gives me what 91,000 of uh, income right that's reported for tax purposes ignoring of course the uh, temporary differences because we've dealt with those and seen how those have created a deferred tax asset and liability I take that 91,000 and I multiply it by the tax rate of 0.3 and I come up now with this 27,300, right? Which is the number that you see right there, my income tax expense. And we're saying, hey, that's the tax expense because it's based on our gap income. And that 11,000 is never going to affect um, the uh, deferred tax asset and liability, okay? That's how you handle permanent differences. Now, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and make you guess as to whether something's permanent difference or temporary difference in questions, and you'll see in the practice midterm a little bit later, I'm going to call them out as such so that you know how to handle them, okay? All right, good. That's how we handle our um, deferred, uh, or I should say a permanent difference that doesn't affect my deferred tax asset or liability. Okay, and as you see in this example, notice the tax rates were the same uh, as we went forward. Um, an entity would need to consider future tax rates assuming those tax rates were actually enacted. Uh, enacted is a key phrase. That means that Congress has already passed the law, it's already been approved, the president has signed off, and they have said that in future years, say 2022, 23, whatever, the tax rates will go from 30% to 32% or something like that. And that is enacted, not proposed, enacted. Then you would need to consider what those enacted tax rates were for future years if they were different than, say, the 30%. Maybe they were going to be, you know, 20% in future years. Doesn't have to go up, could go down. Then in those future years, assuming that law had been enacted, then you would have to uh, consider the impact of those future rates on uh, your deferred tax asset and liability, okay? So just remember that phrase, enacted tax rates, okay? It has to be enacted, and if they change in the future, you would use those to uh, calculate your deferred tax asset and liability against your uh, temporary differences, okay? All right, good. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look now at this concept of loss uh, carry forwards, okay? So what happens? Let's say I have a loss in the current year and I have that loss in the current year. And obviously if I have a loss, I'm not gonna have to report uh, any taxable income because it's a loss, right? They don't tax losses, they tax income. but 
what the tax law said was, you know, if you had a bad year, we're going to help you out a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to let you carry forward that loss to future periods, carry them forward to future periods, and we'll let you offset taxable income in later years by that loss you had in the current year. Okay, so again, we're not getting into tax law here. Just know that if you carry that forward, that loss forward, that is creating a potential tax deferred tax asset because you have that benefit in the future when you'll get to offset future amounts of income uh, against these previous losses. Okay, so again, you can only carry these forward. I know maybe somewhere in your head you might hear about a loss carry back. That's the old law, new law, the uh, jo Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, got rid of the uh, carry backs and so now it's only carry forwards. Okay, so let's just go ahead and just look at that graphically here real quick. You can see that you have the loss in 2020 and then you can carry it forward against potential income that you will have in uh, future years. Okay, so we come over and we have this loss in this event in this uh, in this example of two hundred thousand. The tax rate is twenty percent. They have this loss and they determine that they're going to be able to carry this loss forward. So we take the two hundred thousand times the 0.2 tax percent that gives me a 40,000 deferred tax asset and it's going to reduce my income tax expense because I have this carry forward okay now you go ahead and you take a look at uh, the next slide now and you can see that on our income statement we'll have our loss but because we have this income tax benefit that was generated in this period by this loss, we literally reduce our loss by the amount of tax that we're gonna be saving in the future. And we will now have this um, future economic benefit, this deferred tax asset, okay? So let's see what happens if then in um, the next year, 2021, they return to profitability, they have taxable income of 250,000, um, subject to 20% tax rate, and uh, they realized the benefit of this carry forward, uh, which they had set up as an asset in 2020. Now they see it as a, um, a reduction of their taxable income in 2021. So let's just go ahead and take a look. Taxable income before the carry forward was 250, okay, but then they carry forward. So they have this tax benefit here of this 200,000 carry forward. So the taxable income is 50,000. So they're going to have to send IRS a check for 10,000. Okay, again, whatever your taxable income is times the tax rate, that's taxes payable. Gonna send that to the IRS here. You are now liquidating the deferred tax uh, asset. And then the uh, 50,000 is basically your tax expense based on the current year's uh, income of 250,000. You take that tax expense, okay? All right, good. So not too tough on those carry forwards, assuming of course we're going to be able to realize uh, that benefit at some point. Okay, now if the, um, entity determines that um, they are not going to, oh, um, just going back now to um, that, the, um, okay, let's go ahead and find where we were, okay, so uh, we're here and we make the uh, entry here that you're seeing for the income tax payable and then we again would show the current and uh, deferred portions there when we finally go ahead and um, are able to take advantage of that uh, deferred tax, um, that, that uh, carry forward and that deferred tax asset that was generated by the carry forward, okay? Now, you come over and uh, we take a look at uh, what happens if we wanna use the valuation allowance because maybe we're not going to have income in future periods and so we won't really be able to take advantage of 
that loss carry forward if we don't think we're going to have sufficient income. So if that's the case, again, you would go ahead and set up the deferred tax asset the way we saw the credit to income tax expense. And then it gets a little bit kind of um, much ado about nothing when we go and we debit the income tax expense and take an allowance for this amount that we're saying, well, maybe we won't be able to take advantage of this. And we're doing this because we really don't know whether we're going to have income in the future. Okay. Now you take a look and notice that when you take the amount that we set up in the allowance versus what we set as the carry forward, now our income tax expense is zero and we're selling the entire uh, net loss because we're saying, hey, we maybe won't have income in the future that we'll be able to take advantage of this carry forward. Now, in the event that we do somehow now see some sort of a um, future benefit or we realize that future benefit because we've gone ahead and uh, we've determined that we have income in the future, then we'll go ahead and debit the income tax expense, 50000 credit the deferred tax asset, credit our income tax payable, and now we can go ahead and reverse the allowance setup because we've gotten rid of the asset, the deferred tax asset, get rid of the allowance. We credit the income tax expense allowance so that then when we report on our income statement, we're just showing the current portion, the 10000 that we have paid out uh, to IRS now in this case, or that we're going to be paying out to IRS. Okay. All right, good. So that helps us to see what we should do now with this um, diff, uh, uh, when we're dealing with carry forwards. Okay, and then uh, something that we've already talked about um, here that I want to just finish up with so you see the slide, which is when you have deferred tax asset, deferred tax liability, they are non-current and they are netted against each other, assuming they're from the same taxing authority. And we're just going to be dealing with federal tax um, accounting here. And so we don't have to worry about, you know, hey, different taxing authorities. So asset and liability would be netted, even though in that example, we saw two separate entries for the asset and the liability happening simultaneously. You would want to do that so you could keep track as to how they reverse and whatnot. But for financial reporting purposes, you net the asset and liability and report it as one amount. Okay. All right, guys. A lot of information. I realize what we're going to do is we are going to, um, in a little while, take a look at the practice midterm for Chapter 19. Okay. All right. See you in a little while.